Hello, my name is Father Gregory Pine, and I'm a Dominican friar of the province of St. Joseph, and this is Pines with Aquinas. In this episode, I thought that we could talk about the resurrection of the dead, okay, which is to say the general judgment and the general resurrection. Obviously, we profess belief in the resurrection of the dead in the creed, and, you know, when you search the sacred scriptures and the church's tradition, certainly like the thoughts and writings of the mystics, we find there a rich tradition of meditation on just this theme. But, you know, it's eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it so much as dawned on the heart of man what God has ready for those who love him. And insofar as this is entailed by the life of heaven, or this is the kind of limit or term of the life of heaven, it's something that we just, yeah, have great difficulty wrapping our minds and hearts around. So I thought that, uh, yeah, in this episode, we could think together, kind of pray together through what that might mean or how that might look. Just offer one version, certainly not one that's binding or not one that's defined by the church, but one that's informed, right, by our Catholic teaching and maybe kind of brings that Catholic teaching to certain conclusions. So here we go. So when we approach this theme of the general judgment and general resurrection, we have the conviction that in this time, at the end of the age, all will at last be made manifest. That God will render to each, wholly and entirely, the things that are due to him on account of how he lived in this life. But it's something that goes beyond the particular judgment. So what I just said there seems to pertain perfectly to the particular judgment. So this general judgment must be in some way you know, general. So it's not only that it's rendered to you individually as you stand before God at the moment of your death, right? But it's something that's rendered communally, or it's something that's rendered for the church entire. So both the just, which is to say, you know, the church triumphant, and the unjust, which is to say those who have willingly excluded themselves from the communion of the church while on earth, and then suffer the effects of that in hell for eternity. So it's something that goes beyond the scope of the particular judgment, and also, yeah, you're going to get your body back. So that, that's an additional dimension. Uh, so when one is judged particularly and maybe passes through purgatory or just goes directly to heaven, one comes into the full possession of the life of heaven, and one is wholly and entirely satisfied, right? One is perfect, complete, firing on all cylinders, as it were. Uh, so at the general judgment and by the general resurrection, it's not that uh, an incomplete joy will be made complete, but rather that a complete joy will become more complete, right? So St. Thomas describes it as a kind of overflow. He describes it as a redundancia. So the joy that fills the soul kind of spills over into the body and affords a greater capacity for its enjoyment, all right? So those would be like the kind of general contours or the general shape, as it were. But then what of the judgment that conducts us to that reality or into that fullness? And here I think you'll hear people speculate on this particular theme, but a lot of the speculation kind of, I don't know, it, it seems to fall short. I mean, it's all going to fall short, but some of it seems to fall shorter than others because, you know, we have a sense, okay, it's communal, it's something that we all behold, but isn't that going to be like really embarrassing or shameful? For many of us, like all of our hidden thoughts, words, and deeds are going to be made known to all simultaneously. Like, like, do I want the Blessed Mother to know, or do I want, you know, St. John Paul II to know, or to see, or to behold everything that I've done in an instant in a way that, yeah, doesn't leave me wholly abashed in their presence. Um, so you hear some people describe it like we all go into one big celestial movie theater and we watch the story of, you know, the ages of humanity with each of our roles in that story highlighted. And then we all kind of take it in, as it were, in one glance. Um, yeah, there's something about that that I, that I don't love because of the shame factor, because of the embarrassment factor, and because it just kind of doesn't square with my theological intuitions. Um, so pff, is it bad? I don't think so. I mean, it reveals a certain good or it reveals a certain beauty. But I think that we can do uh, a little bit better. So this is one theory, and I'd be interested in your theories, if you have cool theories about what the general judgment and resurrection might entail. Uh, so feel free to drop those in the comment box, and maybe we can have a fruitful exchange on just those themes. But I want to suggest something that's more personal and interpersonal, right? Something that's more ecclesial and communal, something that's just, yeah, what I think will end up being richer and ultimately more beatifying. So um, my, my sense is that basically like the general judgment and the general resurrection will be arrayed gloriously around the sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is to say around God in his Christ. So obviously it focuses on God and so God, insofar as God is the one who renders the judgment, but also the object of our heavenly gaze. So the beatific vision is the beholding of God, but we behold that 
you know, in light of the incarnation or in beholding that, we behold the sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ, which mediates between God and us. Not that we need that mediation, but that mediation makes it easier. It makes it, you know, nearer. It makes it humaner. Um, that is to say the divine causality. It makes it all of those things. So, so our Lord's sacred humanity is somehow at the center of this vision of God who is the center. Um, and specifically, I'm thinking here of the wounds of our Lord Jesus Christ, which have a way of communicating salvation history with an especial poignancy or urgency. So we're all arrayed around God. We're all arrayed around Christ, okay? And since, you know, the general resurrection is going to be a, a corporeal thing, a bodily thing, I think that having the sacred humanity at the heart of it makes eminent sense because... As 1 Corinthians 15 says, he's the first fruits, right? So it's the order of resurrection is Christ the first fruits and then all those who belong to him. So it's a matter of pertaining. It's a matter of belonging, fellowship, friendship, communion, however you want to describe it, okay? So I think it's important that his sacred humanity is at the heart of that reality, all right? So in this beholding or in the judgment that's rendered, I think it's a kind of acute experience of the fact of his being the mediator of salvation, the one mediator of salvation, all right? And that the kind of um, currency or the unit of exchange of that salvation is just grace, right? Or it's divine life, which is to say grace, which is to say the virtue, specifically the virtue of charity and all that goes with it. And we're going to see how that divine life, grace, charity issues from the Godhead through the sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ and has touched each of our lives. Um, so it'll kind of like issue from him. As the head of the church is one kind of traditional affirmation, but I think here, kind of in the in the setting of this web or network, which I'm going to describe as kind of like the heart, as it were, of the ecclesial reality come to its perfection in heaven. So here's, you know, just kind of a thought experiment, or here's a wild speculation as to what that might look like. I think you can think about this grace charity. You can think about it as kind of like vectors radiating from the glorified flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not in the sense that there's a new causality, right? Like there are new merits being dispersed or that there are like new mysteries of salvation being communicated in this age, but rather it's a, it's a making manifest, right? What has already been communicated. So it's a kind of like rendering of the manifestation and communication in a way that is now kind of seen in globo in the context of the ecclesial body. All right, so you see these vectors that are emanating from the sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And however you want to describe this imaginatively, you know, I have my own thoughts, but I'm not especially creative, so it's going to limp analogically, as do all analogies. Um, but we'll see these, you know, like you'll kind of see these vectors, each issuing from him with a certain trajectory, intensity, complexity, each with its own kind of stamp of particularity and peculiarity. And you'll see how those vectors issue from him and touch the lives of each of those arrayed about him in the life of heaven, okay? And by contrast or comparison, you know, are, are excluded from the lives of those who have excluded themselves from the communion of salvation. So you'll see, you know, this, this kind of network go out from the glorified flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not just like undifferentiated or unspecified, but each goes out as intended for its peculiar object, okay? So it's like... Like, like Christ gives grace in a way that takes account of the object of his love. It's not just like, ah, you know, I mean, the parable of the sower and the seed gives indication that he's super generous, right? He's abundant in the dispensation of grace. That does not mean that he is not intentional or deliberate. It's all pur purposeful, right? It's all, it's all foreseen and foresuffered. So as these, you know, vectors, as it were, each with their own trajectory, intensity, and complexity go forth from the glorified flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ, then they touch the lives of each individual Christian and transfigure or show how each Christian has been transfigured over the course of his or her earthly life and through the progressive stages of purification um, that may have, you know, remained to be undertaken in the life of purgatory, but ultimately, which is on offer or is made visible in heaven, okay? And that would be a cool thing, you know, just to kind of see a web of glory go forth from Christ. But I think as we as we take a second look at this vision, we see it, um, yeah, we see it in a second dimension. Okay, second look, second dimension. There you go. I came up with that all on my own. Um, and here, as, as that grace, as that glory enters the life of each Christian, or as we see it to have entered into the life of each Christian, then in the, the heart of each Christian, you see that grace and glory refracted, 
all right? You see it kind of spun out from each individual Christian and then so communicated subsequently. Not in the sense that the Christian is not capacious or the Christian is not able to receive that grace, because we are, right? It, re it remains with us, it abides in us, it transforms us, and we become, right, possessors of that grace. But, but, but that grace goes beyond the bounds of our own humanity and then touches the lives of those with whom we have had contact, all right, with whom we have had dealings. And so you see the vectors that go out from Christ refracted in the life of individ each individual Christian and then go out into the lives of those whom they have known and loved, each in the particular and peculiar history um, of the earthly life through which they passed. All right. And in this vision, you will see the connections. All right. You, you may, in fact, see the could have been connections or the once were and are no longer connections or the not connections. But principally, what you'll see is the positive. Right. You'll see the connections. You'll see the way in which the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ shared with each individual Christian was subsequently used, right, profited from and then spun out in a variety of different ways, such that it touched the lives of those with whom we had contact or those with whom we had, you know, like relationships or friendships, all right? And what you see here in one vision or in one beholding is a kind of sacred history in the communion of our Lord Jesus Christ's glorified flesh, which then, you know, begets in us a glorified flesh, right? This is the rendering back of the body, the glorified flesh, right? We partake of his wounds as we fill up what is lacking in the sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is to say, as we apply his merits in the course of our lives, or as we live in a particular and peculiar register, the universal and total story, which is his to tell. All right, so Christ continues to tell the story of his salvation in our humanity. And as these vectors go forth, touch each of our lives, and then are refracted into the lives of each other's, that, that, that sacred history kind of gets spun out into the full web of its providential complexity. All right, so as the love redounds from Christ into the lives of each and then gets spun out in every which other direction, then you see the particularity and peculiarity of the transfiguration as it's redoubled right? Insofar as it is taken and used, right? We become causes. We are um, empowered with the dignity of causing. And so, you know, like the transfiguration of his flesh, which touches our flesh, is then redoubled, complexified, intensified, right? By its having been shared in just this way. All right. And, and I keep saying seeing, like we'll see this. We perhaps we'll behold this with our bodily eyes, depending on the timing, as it were, of the rendering back of our human flesh. But it's a, it's a kind of experiencing. Maybe we can just leave it at that. Um, so principally and primarily, it's an intellectual beholding, says St. Thomas Aquinas, of the beatific vision. right? But it's something that, that registers at the core of our humanity. Okay. So this is a thought experiment. This is my idea. This is not settled doctrine. All right. This is not, you know, necessarily how it's going to be, but it's, it's something that helps me to appreciate um, kind of like the logic of the life of heaven, the logic of the general judgment and resurrection as like what it might hold, okay? Might there be errors that have crept into my account? Yes, I haven't yet identified them, but I'd be happy to receive, you know, corrections or kind of redirections in the comments. Um, yeah, so just then maybe for a final piece of this video, just thinking about the effects of this vision or, or what are the logical consequences of this type of vision? Well, I think I think what you see here in the general judgment and resurrection is the consummate realization of the common good, right? The common good towards which we have been striving at every level, right, of our human existence, which is to say, you know, like in the context of the family and intermediate institutions and society, the civil polity, right, the church, right? All of this is trying to attain to a good which is maximally transcendent and good, right, which disperses its goodness to all present within the ecclesial body and is not diminished in being so dispensed or dispersed, right? So this is like the consummate perfect realization of the common good as we possess Christ and are possessed by Christ. So while what I've described kind of transpires at a distance, this is all in the intimacy of communion with our Lord Jesus Christ, right? This is done in his sacred flesh as our flesh partakes of the glory of his, all right? And what I find especially beautiful about a vision like this is that, you know, you behold reality with a deep sympathy and you see it as the fruit of relationships, right? Of interdependencies. I think here of Alistair McIntyre's book, Dependent Rational Animals, like we're meant to be dependent upon each other. We go to God together. If we are to attain to the communion of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's through friendship with our Lord Jesus Christ, which friendship is communicated in a variety of other relationships in the setting of family, intermediate institutions, the civil polity, and the church. So we go to God together, which is to say, in the context of this terrestrial communion, we touch something of the celestial communion and we attain their own too. So I love this vision because it's not like a passive beholding of a terrible movie in which I myself am the antagonist, but, right, but, but, but it's a beholding of the way in which 
you know, like I have pertained, I have pertained to the ecclesial body from the beginning and have come to the perfection of it now. Will I see deficiencies, lack, excesses, whatever, defects and stuff? Yeah, undoubtedly. But it'll be covered, as it were, by the mercy which issues from the grace, charity, kind of coming forth from the glorified flesh of Christ, passing through our own humanity as it is refracted into the lives of others, as we're drawn more intimately and urgently into the communion of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I think it's cool because you see the role that you occupy in providence, not as a way to be like, nice work, me, but as a way to be like, holy smokes, God is present before, during, and after, preparing a way, filling up for what is lacking and leading unto its consummation, the whole work of glory in my life for myself, for others, but ultimately unto the praise of his glory. Um, not because he's selfish or creepy, but because that's the whole point, the whole cosmic tendency of the grand plan. And so, you know, like we, we await a vision of the end of the role that we have occupied in the providence of God, right? But that's something that we can already partake of now. So our lives are tending in a real way towards this general judgment and resurrection because by virtue of, you know, like the wisdom and charity which God pours into our hearts by the sending of Son and Holy Spirit into our lives, right? We can be enlightened and emboldened into a fuller embrace of this vision and a kind of entry into this vision. We can become yet more perfect agents of the unfolding of providence now such that when it comes to that general resurrection and the judgment which precedes it, right? We'll behold what we have known in the marrow of our bones all along the course of the way, but now is brought to perfection because we have sought at every step to be willing, whole and entire, willing agents of the providence of God because God's plans are good, right? They are for me and they will attain to their realization provided only that I consent to and cooperate with the grace that he gives by the grace that he gives. So yeah, that's a vision that commissions us for the present and lies in store for us at the end. That is what I wanted to share. This is Pines with Aquinas. If you haven't yet, please do subscribe to the channel, push the bell, and get updates when other things come out on the channel. So that way you can grow in your faith and attain to the love of God with greater fervor and intensity. Also, if you haven't yet, please do check out the podcast God's Planning, where I talk about all kinds of things just like this with four of my Dominican brothers as you hear the fruit of our contemplation and preaching on a weekly basis and sometimes more often. And then I wrote a book. That book is called Prudence, Choose Confidently, Live Boldly, and I'd love for you to read it. Um, certainly, you know, prayed and sacrificed that it would be of profit to those who do. And I hope that it may attain to that end ultimately. So, uh, yeah, check it out if you haven't yet. Boom. My prayers are for you. Please pray for me. I'll catch you next time on Pints with Aquinas.